Good afternoon to uh, everyone, and uh, I'm certainly happy to be here, or happy to be anywhere, quite frankly. Um, but welcome to all of you, uh, another installment of our speaker series. Earlier this month, um, during our Lunch and Learn, we heard from Illinois State President Don Harmon. Our discussion focused in on uh, the role he and the Senate play in state government, as well as in our day-to-day -day lives. This week, we will continue to hear from top elected officials at the state level through our Let's Talk State Government speaker series. Now, it's crucial that voters stay engaged and active in their local county and state government, even when there isn't an election around the corner. And one of the best ways to stay engaged is to educate yourself on the various positions at the state level and the various duties and responsibilities they have. I am more than happy today to introduce our next speaker, Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul, who will discuss the role he and the Attorney General's office play in state and local government, as well as in our day-to-day -day lives. Attorney General Kwame Raoul was sworn in as the 42nd Attorney General of Illinois in January of 2019. Born in Chicago to Haitian immigrants, he brings a lifetime of legal and policy experience, advocacy and public service to the Office of General Attorney General. As the state's chief legal and law enforcement officer, the Attorney General has demonstrated a commitment to protecting Illinois residents by leading the quote unquote people's law firm. He has initiated efforts to provide aid to those impacted by violence, defends the right of workers, protects consumers from scams, and boy, do we have scams. Um, and especially he's been uh, throughout the uh, COVID-19 global pandemic, he's been very, very active. In addition to, to these efforts, he's focused on enhancing collaborations between the Attorney General's Office and the federal and local law enforcement partnerships to engage in joint enforcement efforts to keep firearms out of the hands of dangerous individuals. He participates in threat assessment trainings for law enforcement and school personnel and to uphold the integrity of public officials across the state. He has also taken a leadership role in addressing the unique and multi-jurisdictional issues that have arisen out of the COVID-19 pandemic through the creation of a task force made up of federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies to combat widespread unemployment insurance fraud. Now, before he was elected Attorney General and, and, and uh, Attorney General Raul spent 14 years serving as state senator in the 13th legislative district. Uh, I might add that um, he actually took um, our favorite son who went to Washington, we sent him off to Washington to become the president and Kwame stepped into not Barack Obama's shoes because he had a pair of his own, but he filled that slot. So um, as Senator, he also led in negotiations and sponsored many significant measures that require mandatory background checks, check and uh, private transfers of guns, law enforcement, criminal justice reform, Kwame, it runs the gamut, all the stuff that you've done. Um, I had the opportunity of working very closely with Kwame because he was the Senate sponsor on the Senate side to abolish the death penalty in Illinois. And oh my goodness, it was something to do that. Uh, and sometimes he and I, when we talk about that story, it's, you know, we shake our heads. We're wondering how we even got that done. Um, uh, Kwame Raul is a graduate of DePaul University. He learned that he earned his law degree from Chicago Kent College of Law. He is married to Dr. Lisa Moore and a couple of the parents of four children, Shay, Mizan, John, and Madison. Kwame, welcome. Welcome and thank you so much for um, agreeing to be with us today. I truly know how, you know, uh, busy you are. You're all over the state. I just saw you the other day and I was really, I hadn't seen you in a minute, but I know that you've got lots of stuff on your plate. So with that, why don't you take it away? Um, I've tried to get into as much of your background as I could, but 
I know there's more. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, first of all. And, and, and I know it's after Labor Day and I'm not supposed to wear these colors, but you, you mentioned that uh, I get all over the state. I also have the opportunity to um, travel throughout the country um, meeting with other attorneys general and right now. I'm in um, Miami where it's okay to wear these colors <laughs> after after Labor Day because I have a series of meetings um, um, with the Democratic uh, uh, Attorney General's Association on behalf of the Democratic Attorneys General uh, Association. In fact, um, it's, it, it's so, sort of timely. You mentioned I'm um, of Haitian descent. Um, uh, most of the meetings um, I'm having uh, here on today and tomorrow, um, which was were planned uh, months in advance, uh, are with um, um, active Haitian voices in the, in in Democrat uh, politics, um, and many of those voices arise from uh, southern southern Florida. And this is a timely meeting because, uh, as we've all seen, the horrific pictures at the at the border. Um, of border patrol agents um, uh, using their reins and their horses to corral um, refugees as, as if they were cattle. Um, one of the things I get to do as attorney general is collaborate with attorneys general from throughout the country. And today we will be in issuing a, um, a letter to the president and to um, um, Mr. Mayorkas, who's head of the Homeland Security, um, appealing to them to uh, rethink their repatriation policy and to, to ask for individualized assessment of those seeking refuge, given um, that um, they're being re repatriated to a country that has suffered from a recent earthquake, uh, tropical storm, assassination of a president, if there were ever circumstances that would call for eligibility for parole, um, that would be it. And so I mention that because it's it's timely because uh, it, it's reflective of, of one of the roles I have as Attorney General. You mentioned what many of the things that I do within state, but we also are active um, on a national level, um, uh, and immigration issues is one of the areas and this is one of the issues that I'm actually leading on uh, my office. We penned the letter that's been signed on to by many other attorneys general from throughout the country and um, we've been in touch with the White House and we'll be meeting with the White House. They've agreed to meet with us on, on this particular issue. But there are other issues. You, I'm, I'm really glad that you led with that because I am. Um, I, I mentioned to you the other day. I'm very bothered by those those pictures that I've seen, and you know, I I, I get it. You know uh, about what you know. The, our borders are, are need to be mm -hmm. secure. But what happened to the bring me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses? What happened to that? You know, we got this situation in Afghanistan where those folks are coming here, of course. And, you know, when I saw that, you know, these pictures of what, you know, they were turning people away from Haiti, it just, it really bothered me. So I'm glad that you're taking this, this take, taking this on. And why wouldn't you? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it, it's important not to, uh, it, the pictures were horrific. Um, uh, I think a dangerous thing about focusing too much on the pictures, um, it, it sort of, you know, I'm a Democrat, of course, but um, that doesn't mean that I don't hold other Democrats uh, accountable, and that includes the President of the United States. Um, you know, the President of the United States has denounced the actions uh, reflected in the pictures. However, uh, concurrently, there's a rush to repatriate um, all of these refugees. And, and it's important to understand um, asylum um, law and policy in, 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 when, you, when, you, when you talk about this, because I am not by any means say, just open up the borders and just let everybody in. Um, what I'm saying is for those who are legitimately seeking asylum, 
uh, for humanitarian political um, um, danger reason. You know, there there are gangs that are just running um, in the absence of a of a um, stability in government after the assassination of a president. Um, the gangs are ruling in many areas of Haiti right now. So it's a dangerous thing to repatriate um, these individuals in mass to, to a country that's been devastated by earthquake, by, by a tropical storm and by um, political unrest to the level of assassination of the president. Um, and it's, this is reflective of a disparate immigration policy. Um, we've seen you know, a, a different approach to people from coming from different uh, countries. And uh, all we're advocating for is a fair assessment of a, a asylum claim. But um, I know you didn't have me to, on to talk about this, but I, I decided to mention that because um, obviously it's one of the most current um, events and it's one of the, the most current event that uh, reflects the way that we um, talk with one another as attorneys general. As you mentioned, um, you know, I've, I've been serving as attorney general since um, January 2019. And at the time I decided to run um, um, late in 2017 when uh, Lisa Madigan uh, uh, made her uh, sort of late announcement that she would not be seeking re-election. Re Ironically, about four years earlier, there was heavy anticipation that she might run for governor. And I started to prepare running for attorney general then. Um, and then she decided she was running for re-election. So I just sat my butt down and <laughs> remained in the, in, 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 in the Senate. But um, at the time I started considering running for attorney general, I did not, um, I, 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 did, I knew much of the role of the attorney general's office, both within state and um, in collaboration with other attorneys general fighting rollbacks of environmental protection, uh, um, working on voter protection, working on access to health care, uh, uh, protection of reproductive health, uh, of access to reproductive health care uh, on, on, on a wide range of issues. But no way would have I anticipated a couple of things happening during my tenure. One is an unprecedented pandemic uh, that would have us uh, almost overnight shift to a, a, a stay at home period, um, as well as um, various mitigations that, um, that the governor put in place uh, to help us deal with, um, to help us deal with um, this healthcare crisis that was taking lives and filling up our hospitals. My wife, uh, as you mentioned, is, is a physician and she's an anesthesiologist. She's had to intubate people who went on to ventilators um, as a sort of the last means of um, um, trying to save their, their lives. Um, she's dealt with having to, to not uh, engage in elective series, uh, surgeries for a period of time because hospitals were so overwhelmed with COVID patients. We have a situation now where in some areas of the state, there are no ICU beds. Um, the hospitals are overwhelmed. I heard a story the other day of, I forget what jurisdiction this was, of a, a, a boy whose appendix burst because uh, he was waiting in an emergency room for so long. So the need, you know, people talk about uh, these mitigations as inconvenient and how they've impacted businesses and so forth. I understand the frustration that people have had, but we've gone around defending the governor's mitigations because they are truly life-saving. Um, I advocated for um, vaccination. I very publicly took my uh, shot because, um, because of the science. And we now know that some 99% of the people who are in the hospital uh, for, for serious symptoms of COVID-19 are unvaccinated. Uh, if there is not a uh, science that supports vaccination, uh, if there is science that supports anything uh, as strong as that, uh, I, I don't know where it is. And so when people start saying it's about a, uh, it's just about a personal choice, no, it's not because that choice impacts access to healthcare. 
and I'm a cancer survivor and, and it's important for me to advocate and to use my office to advocate for that access to healthcare. And we've done so um, on a national level, um, advocating all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, successfully preserving the Affordable Care Act, um, but we have to do so within the state as well. Um, and so we've been very active on that, uh, on that front all over the state. Um, there are a number of issues, uh, you mentioned some that, uh, that have been important to me. You know, I, I, um, I, I've benefited from Lisa Madigan's term. She was a tremendous uh, attorney general. Uh, I inherited a lot of her talented staff. I've been able to recruit um, uh, much of my own staff and I'm very proud of the staff we have uh, in, in the attorney general's office. You would be uh, pleasantly surprised at the pedigree and the experience of, of some of the attorneys within the office, um, especially when you juxtapose it to the level of pay that uh, I compensate them with, which is that they, they're woefully underpaid. Um, but these um, attorneys have been able to rise to the occasion and, um, and uh, with unprecedented challenges. Again, the pandemic was one of those unprecedented challenges. The other was something that forced a lot of people into self-reflection. And that was when a 17 year old girl in Minneapolis uh, filmed um, the murder by, by me of a, of a police officer of George Floyd. Um, that forced um, all of the nation and much of the world into a time of self-reflection. And it, 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 it inspired me to take up something that I had started to take up in the, the General Assembly when I was serving in the General Assembly. And that was to uh, try to advocate for police licensing or a uh, more robust uh, decertification uh, uh, certification to certification process within the state. And I did this, decided to do so with my law enforcement partners um, as partners. We met over 25 times over um, a, uh, about five or six month period uh, um, to work on legislation uh, that was law enforcement led that uh, created a circumstance um, um, where uh, we can hold accountable those who are not, um, um, not don't have the integrity to serve as a law enforcement officer. And no longer will we have a, a system that allows uh, uh, po uh, police officers to engage in misconduct at one police department and then go get hired at another police department because we begin to treat them as we treat people in every other profession like lawyers, uh, doctors, hairdressers, even uh, barbers, uh, where there will be a state, um, the I let's be, will, will, will be able to evaluate um, claims of misconduct beyond just whether or not somebody got convicted of, of, of something. And um, I was proud to do that work because of how we did it as much as uh, what the product was, because we did it in partnership with the uh, Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police Illinois Sheriff's Association, uh, the State's Attorney's Association. And we were able to do so because I started to build those partnerships at the beginning of my, my, my tenure. And we've collaborated on a great many things, including the IDES of fraud, which we have a, we, we co-chair a task force with the FBI. Um, I recruited a chief of investigations who's a veteran of the FBI. My chief of staff is a former, uh, um, assistant U.S. attorney uh, in the Northern District. Um, as a result of recruiting a 30-year veteran of DuPage County State's Attorney's Office, a 30-year veteran of the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, I've, we've really been able to enhance our partnership with prosecutors and with the uh, law enforcement throughout the state. I announced uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Organized Retail Crime Task Force. Much of the policy we've been engaged in and, and within the state has been to talk about what should our uh, threshold be between mi misdemeanor and, and felony. And that's a worthy debate, but there's something going on um, that's um, equally as important, if not more important than that, 
there are organized crime outfits who recruit um, homeless people who engage in human trafficking of um, undocumented immigrants and, and others take advantage of people, use them as mules to go into stores and steal items. They took advantage of the, the looting that went on, on, on the, uh, uh, um, during the protests that we saw last year. And you, you heard stories of U-Haul trucks being uh, lined up outside of these, um, um, some big box stores as well as other stores that, that uh, for example, uh, 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 Greater North Michigan Avenue, um, but throughout the state. And this is something that's been going on for years actually throughout the country. And I've taken a leadership role um, within the Attorney General Alliance um, as well um, as, as here at the, in the state to try to tackle this problem because it costs um, uh, millions of dollars, um, not only to the stores, but um, of tax revenue um, to, to, to the state. And so um, we've got ongoing investigations on that front um, and that are very promising. And uh, you should expect to hear it from us soon with regards to uh, some of those. I'll shut up for a second and, and so, you know, reply you know, to your thinking, question. I was going <laughs> to let you take a drink of water or something. Yeah. And, and I wanted you to, to, to consider this. You know, when you were elected in um, uh, to this office, 74% uh, of the Illinois voters believed that the criminal justice system was broken. So um, what policies and practices have you enacted to improve our justice system and gain back public trust? Uh, there is a lack of public trust, not just, you know, for the AG's office, but across the board, but people don't feel safe. And so what mm -hmm. kinds of uh, policies have you uh, um, promoted, uh, enacted, uh, you know, what, what? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, and I think I started to talk about one of them, which was the law enforcement yeah. reform that we, we, we uh, engaged in, but it's not just engaging in it. Uh, unfortunately, the way we talk about um, law enforcement reform is so um, 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 polarizing, right? You know, and we we off we too often we use we use a broad brush, and there are false dichotomies that uh, develop where you say if if you dare talk about uh, engaging in policy changes for law enforcement reform, you're somehow anti-police. Yeah. Yeah. Or on the or, or on the other side, if you if you dare talk denounce um, violence towards police officers or burning of police cars or looting um, uh, on the fringes of of of, of protests, uh, that you're somehow anti law enforcement reform. Neither is true. You know, I think everybody on this uh, viewing this call can walk and chew gum at the same time, and we as policymakers and public officials can do the same. So I have many personal friends as well as um, employees who are law enforcement uh, officers. And, um, and so by no means does any of my work on law enforcement reform uh, seek to denigrate any one of those individuals or the institutions that they, 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 for which they work. Um, but at the same time, in order to have, to have good clearance rates, in order to solve crimes, you need the public help um, because they are your witnesses, right? Yeah. And in order for you to have um, the public's help, you need the public's confidence. And the public's confidence gets undermined every time a bad police officer does something, um, mm -hmm. um, engages in misconduct. And, and, uh, and you know, there is a, a low level of morale within police departments these days. Um, and some of it grows out of unfair um, characterizations and broad brushes. Sure. Um, um, but some of it grows out of um, tolerance for the misdeeds of coming from some of their, 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 their colleagues. And we have to work on, on both. We have to be able to talk about this in, in a way that respects the fact that people put on the uniform every morning and, and leave out of their front or their back door do so, not knowing what risks that they might face that day that might prevent them from coming back into that door. 
Um, uh. So I, pre I appreciate every um, individual who takes that risk on a, uh, on a daily basis. And, and I can do that and at the same time advocate for uh, greater professionalism and greater account accountability. It's, the other thing that I think that um, um, we have to do is to understand the trauma um, that survivors of crime um, endure. And when I talk about survivors of crime, I'm not talking only people who directly are the victims of a sexual assault or domestic violence or who are shooting victim, but those who are vicarious uh, victims as well. Young people who uh, witness shootings in their neighborhoods, that's traumatizing. It's, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be normal in, in certain neighborhoods for seven, eight, nine-year-olds to know somebody who's been killed either on their on their block or at the school or in, in their family. That, that shouldn't be normal for any neighborhood. Um, but unfortunately in certain neighborhoods it, it is, and that's traumatizing, not just to the people who suffered the direct harm, um, but to those who vicariously uh, suffered that trauma. And we've got to deal with that. And we've been trying from our office to begin to deal with that through our crime victim services um, division. So uh, President Lipka has a question in the, in the chat and he's asking, is there evidence that these uh, organized retail crime groups actually follow planned demonstrations and a spontaneous protest in order to transform angry groups into rioting mobs, rioting as a smoke screen for their strategic theft of retail stores? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen anything to, um... In, 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 in our investigations, and not that I'm going to disclose much of, about the details of any ongoing investigations, but um, I don't know that we've seen anything of evidence to, to, to show that they, that they start the protests, right? I think some of, some of the protests are, are organic por protests or protests that are, you know, are organized by legitimate people who are upset about uh, policies or the lack thereof but there are people who take advantage of that. And there are people who take advantage of that organically as well, individuals who just go out and say, okay, I'm gonna loot. But there are other people who know that that activity is gonna go on and they send out people with shopping lists, specific items to, to, to take. Um, yeah, Home Depot is one of our kind of industry partners in some investigations, and they've had uh, investigations throughout the country. And they, uh, they can show you uh, pictures of warehouses that have been raided. Um, uh, they look like they're a hardware store because they have so many items yeah, so yeah. well organized. Yeah. And what they utilize is the online platforms. So particularly during the pandemic, I know everybody on here, or maybe everybody on here has probably used an online platform to get purchase something. Um, a red flag would be if you're, if you're purchasing a new appliance, for instance, on an online platform, and there's no offer of any uh, warranty uh, for the product. Um, that might be a red flag that, that, that it's a stolen, um, product being um, resold on online platforms. So that's why we have challenged and we have asked and we are partnering with the Internet Association, which is comprised of many of the online platforms, Amazon, the Ebays and, 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 and you know, Craigslist and so forth, um, for them to take responsibility and help us in our effort. Um, to crack down on this because their platforms often, it's no longer just go out and sell it in the back alley or at the flea market. It, it's, it, 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 it's made a lot easier for them because they can just put it on, online for sale. I, I see somebody's posted on top of policing and public trust. Can you discuss your recent announcement to open an investigation into the Joliet Police Department? Now, you just said you don't want to, uh, you know, uh, especially talk about any ongoing investigation. Is there anything you can tell us about why you opened it up? I don't even know what the issue well, is. Well, we, we were um, 
we were invited by the 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 mayor and some city council members in, in Joliet to look into a, a, a particular case. And um, simultaneously on the fringes of that case, which was the Eric Lurie case, um, there were people complaining about uh, policing practices generally. And so in response to the mayor's inv uh, invitation, we, what we said is, um, state's attorney or alternatively the U.S. attorney's office if there was any uh, reason to believe um, that, that, that there was misconduct in that particular case. However, uh, what we did have authority to do, and this is by way of uh, the, uh, a component of the legislation I mentioned earlier that included the uh, um, police decertification um, element, uh, we also appealed to the state legislature, and, and, and I should also mention that uh, I led a group of attorneys general to appeal to Congress to include in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act authority to be given to state attorneys general to conduct patterns and practice investigations. And of course, Congress did put that in the act after we requested, um, but the Senate uh, didn't was unable to, to, to pass that. So I went to our state legislature to ask for that same authority within the state. And they did, they, they were able to pass that in, 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 in the package that the um, um, uh, Black Caucus um, uh, passed this past oh, January. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's under that authority that we initiate, after having some preliminary investigation, uh, we felt that there was enough indicia to um, have reason to go into a, a more um, complete investigation to see whether there's um, enough uh, patterns or practice of unconstitutional policing to, that would mandate for further action. And so we're at the sort of the beginning of that more comprehensive investigation. We have uh, met with the, with the mayor, uh, with um, the police chief. Uh, we've had initial contact with the head of the um, sergeant's union and the, the FOP in, in, in Joliet with some community members. Um, and um, and um, so, uh, I, you know, beyond that, uh, that's it's, fine. It's, That's fine. At least you got. At least you got that in. Um, but I should say, I should say, just in, just just tie that up. I mean, this is again, this is not. We're not hunting for opportunities. And again, we were invited to to look at things there, and so um, we, we're not on fishing expeditions, um, and we wouldn't. We would not engage in this more complete an investigation of if, if we didn't feel there was indicia to do so. So one question I get all the time, um, and maybe for our audience today, maybe you could um, kind of elucidate this. Most folks don't know who to call or who to reach out to when, when something happens. Do they contact the attorney general's office? Do they contact the state's attorney's office? Do they contact the U.S. attorney? I mean, we have all yeah. these layers. And then they, uh, by the same token, you know, when you start at the, um, the, you know, so you have your local police departments and then you have the sh sheriff, you know, the county. And then, you know, we have all these layers of um, folks who are here to protect the public trust and, where do people go? Yeah, so it, it, it's a very good question. And it's a good question for several reasons. You know, one, I can't tell you how many times, particularly in the context of, you know, all the, the, rec the reckoning that we, we've been going through since uh, George Floyd, there's been criticism of me and my office for not doing what Keith Ellison did in, in Minneapolis or, or other, attorneys general may have done on one issue or another in their jurisdiction. One thing to know, we may have the same title in different states, um, but we don't have the same jurisdiction from state to state. So there are, um, when you take the attorney general for Rhode Island, for instance, uh, 
Um, they serve as as the state prosecutor and the local prosecutor. They 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 have the full jurisdiction. We have a system here in the state of Illinois where um, uh, the the local state's attorney uh, has juris jurisdiction over most criminal prosecutions. That's not to say that we don't come in in certain instances. We've prosecuted, for instance, a number of murders in Vermilion County um, um, by invitation because the state's attorney felt that the um, um, state's attorney's former public defender felt that they're um, conflicted out on uh, a, a number of cases. We step into certain counties um, to help in prosecutions of murders and other serious crimes because um, those counties are smaller counties with smaller offices and they just need the help. We may come into Cook County where there may be a question of a conflict or something like that, but Cook County would have the original jurisdiction. Public integrity is an area. Everybody says, oh, well, the attorney general doesn't do enough on, on public integrity. Well, the attorney general doesn't have enough authority to do. We don't have statewide grand jury authority on, 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 on public corruption. Um, that's not to say that we never engaged in, uh, we do have a public integrity unit. We, we've recently charged a couple of cases uh, where we were invited in by way of conflict or by, you know, by way of having had been engaged in, 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 in an investigation. Um, but it's important to understand um, that we, you know, we don't have a uh, certain jurisdiction. Um, the U.S. Attorney's Office has has, has broad um, jurisdiction as long as it's if there's a violation of a you know federal uh, statute, and um, the local states' attorneys have broad jurisdiction within their within their geographic area. There are a number of things such as um, human trafficking, gang activity that goes across. Um, um, County boundaries, money laundering, um, uh, things of that nature that we do have a uh, statewide grand jury authority um, for. Big job. Um, Big yeah. job. And Jeez. We have, and then, you know, that's just on the criminal side, right? So we, you know, we obviously have a consumer protection uh, unit, we have an environmental um, unit, we have an antitrust uh, bureau. Um, we have a civil rights unit that's engaged in the implementation of the consent decree with the Chicago Police Department and, uh, and obviously engaged in the investigation with Joliet, as well as other things in civil rights and, and, and uh, special litigation unit that's uh, active in a lot of the mitigation, uh, COVID mitigation cases that are being litigated all around the state wow. and, and a super uh, appellate team um that um uh, is engaged in appellate advocacy both within the state as well as at the federal level so tell me this and, and we're, we're winding down now um what is it that you would like us to know that is just not commonly known about what it what it means to become you know the state's top lawyer um Several things. One I mentioned already is that our staff. Um, I, I, you know, you served in the General Assembly, and um, you know, well, let me start here um, because we both served in the General Assembly, and we we all remember when it came to appropriations time, time to pass the budget, and um, yeah. there's a general general revenue fund. Uh, a bit of history. Um, when Lisa Madigan took over as attorney general, this, the attorney general's office was about 66% funded, um, 66 or 67% funded by the general revenue fund of the state and 33% and self-funded. By the time I took over, um, we were 30, about 33 or 34% funded by the general, about 33% funded by the general revenue fund and 67% uh, self-funded, so the in, inverse. So as a result of that, um, you know, um, our salaries for, for years were, were trailing, of course we trailed the private sector, but our salaries were trailing public sector employers of lawyers. So we weren't, 
we weren't only vulnerable to being poached by the by the private sector, but very vulnerable to being poached by public sector of employment lawyers. And that shouldn't be because the work of the attorney general's office is such important work. And that's, that's why we've been able to retain so much talent because of the sort of sexiness of the work that the, they get to, to, to work on, the, the, the meaningful nature of it. And so I've been unapologetic at, of, about going to the general assembly and saying, I need more money to pay my people, right? You know, uh, the, the, these are lawyers that come from the top law schools in the country, many who came from large firms, from clerkships with the federal judges. And, and you, you would be surprised at the, the, the pedigree and the talent that we have within the uh, attorney general's office. And, and they're really hardworking uh, uh, folks. The other thing I would say is that it, it is really, I was a little, torn about leaving the General Assembly because of the opportunity to work along with colleagues as we did on the abolition of the death penalty as, as well as other issues. But I have that opportunity, not only to work with the legislature here in Illinois, but to work with my AG colleagues. Uh, I, we meet uh, far more frequently than I would have anticipated. Um, and we work on things and we, we are uh, you know, communicating with one another um, you know, I've already had several conversations today with some of my colleagues from around the country um, and stuff uh, surrounding the ongoing opioid, a resolution of ongoing opioid litigation that impacts, that's impacted every community in every state or uh, every corner of every state in, in, in the country. And so um, the, the, the extent to which we collaborate, um, sometimes on a partisan basis, but Oftentimes, on a nonpartisan uh, basis, it, you know, many people would be surprised. And I built a lot of friendships um, on both sides of the aisle as a result. Well, having your back, the, the background that you have helps you to do uh, the job that you're doing, and certainly serving in the General Assembly um, and, and learning that process. I know that's helped me in the job that I have currently. Um, Tim Curry is a former uh, police chief, and he says that as a law enforcement person, he says that you get it. <laughs> and oftentimes such leaders appear to act without consulting with the experts or knowing what really it really takes place in that world. Um, good cops really do want accountability and reform, but they are silent because the repercussions are real. Keep up the great work. How about it? Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and, and, and there's, there's one thing that I want to mention about that, too, that I didn't really mention earlier is because, you know, we often, you know, we're in a different world now of, of policing. You know, everybody gets an eye towards instantaneous decision making. And it, everything that is reflected in a, either a body cam video or um, um, a phone a video, sometimes we prejudge not knowing um, yeah, that's true. The, the, the intricacies and the split the second decision making that has to take place um, in, in, in police working. And so um, we have a lot of lay people trying to determine what is a good shoot and a bad shoot. And sometimes it gets dangerous, particularly when you have media that gets to slow down videos and focus on one part of the video. Um, it's a really dangerous thing. I do support the use of body cams. I think they're 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 useful not just for accountability but for instruction as well. Um, but we have to be careful about. Um, um, I think if every human being um, had an opportunity to go through a police training exercise where they had to make split second decisions, they'd have a better set sense of some of the challenges that are officers uh, face. Um, so I just want to okay. put that in there. All right, um, your last question, and you know, you can wrap up however you'd like uh, to wrap up. Um, what kind of crimes are surging uh, in Illinois? Well, um, certainly um, the violent crimes of guns, right? Um, yeah, sure. You know, carjackings and, um, you know, we have, um, you know, our role in prosecuting anything such as a carjacking is very limited, but we're trying to figure, 
figure out our place there. We've created a crime gun tracing platform to, to, we have been involved in prosecuting some gun, investigating and prosecuting some gun running cases in partnership with local police departments and, and local state's attorneys. Uh, we've, we've created um, this gun, crime gun tracing platform in partnership with Everytown. Um, we have, um, we recently sued the ATF because they, they allowed a rogue gun manufacturer that, that, that manufactures guns that are actually illegal to even possess in the state of Illinois because they're really cheap guns that are known to be used in some carjackings. Um, it, it, they, they, they're guns that melt at a certain level of uh, uh, heat. That's how cheap some of these guns are. It, this company was previously disbanded and they just emerged under a new name. And, wow. and, and we felt that the ATF did not do the, the, the appropriate evaluation and allowing that to happen. So we, in conjunction with um, actually the city of Kansas City, um, um, sued the ATF and that's on uh, ongoing litigation. So um, yeah, obviously, I mean, we and I said it back when we were we were in a general assembly. I, I said that when we were to, when we were embracing cert, certain reforms with regards to heroin. I said, you know, there was a time when heroin was constrained to certain yeah. neighborhoods, That's and right. That's right. you know, we started really confronting it when it evolved into yep. problems in suburban and rural um, uh, communities. And I said um, back then, um, when we were both in general assembly, well, today's today's heroin that might grow into problems for other communities is gun violence. And we're seeing it. We're seeing instances of carjackings and gun violence taking place in areas where, like in downtown Chicago, where, where we didn't see it at the same level as we saw it before. And part of that is because we didn't confront it the way we, we, we should have uh, comprehensive. When we didn't confront the problems of those communities where, where the gun violence was, uh -huh. was more so tolerated for so long um which um you know and, and it's not and and when i say that i'm not i'm not pointing the finger at um at, at police right yeah i'm saying from from a community standpoint nobody i often say this uh, i know of nobody who came out the womb with a gun in their hand and with a heart to do something violent towards their neighbor right. That's right. something something happens between that time in their lives is uh, that allows them to evolve into that person that's what we need to address yeah uh, that's yeah. what we desperately need to need mm. to address because because these perpetrators are becoming young they're younger and yes. younger yeah 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 that uh that's a good wrap up for us um uh bernie gresham he's uh he he said he wants to thank you for your service here you know we always thank veterans for their service but Big job you have to do and well qualified you certainly are for that job. So I'm glad that you're there oh. for me. I'm a taxpayer in the state of Illinois, so I'm glad that you're there for oh. me. Bernie, Bernie, Bernie and I go back at least 45 years. Oh we went to <laughs> elementary school together. So oh good lord. Good. Okay. <laughs> Well, anyway, he wants to thank you for your service, and I certainly want to do the same on behalf of the Maywood Proviso Rotary Club and the clerk's office. Thank you so much for being here, and keep fighting the good fight. Karen, thank, can thank I make you. a comment? Oh, yeah, sure, Gary, go ahead. Yes, I want to thank your office because a couple of years ago, we were scammed uh, in our... We got a bill for one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars in uh, back taxes, and it was uh, the people who uh, we had hired to to do our work. And within a week of contacting your office, uh, we were suddenly uh, getting it all resolved hundred and hundred and fifty thousand dollars less or something so we're talking a big time scam of seniors of seniors wow, wow. Well, thank you for raising that we our, our our consumer group is is really we've been overwhelmed i mean it's it's been a lot and we've had the challenge of um 
a cyber attack that you know crippled our office for yeah. several months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and I, as advice to everybody out there, no matter what type of organization um, you're in, um, uh, it's worthwhile to invest in um, some cybersecurity and to make sure that uh, you go through and some 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 sometimes what may seem like inconvenient but necessary uh, protocols to minimize the chance. And I say minimize because there's no 100% uh, um, you know, tool that uh, you can have. There are people who spend all their time, time figuring out how to compromise your systems. And, and it was very crippling to us, but our staff, again, um, responded to the challenge. Mr. President. Um, Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm going to turn this over to you. But again, um, Attorney General Kwame Wabu, thank you so very much for being with us. I look forward to seeing you out there and about, but keep fighting for us. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Mr. President. Thank you for really an amazing presentation. And thank you, uh, Honorable Clerk Yarborough, for, uh, again, your work to bring in these speakers each week. Could you give us, we just have about four minutes to go. Could you just, and I've got a couple of other announcements and Jamika, if you're still on, is Jamika on board, Bonnie? Yeah, if she is, we'd want to talk about membership, but Karen, could you just give us a look ahead at next week? Oh, you think I'm that good? <laughs> <laughs> I think you have the state treasurer next week. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I don't recall. Yeah, it is the state treasurer, uh, Mike Frericks. I actually ran into him uh, the same time I ran into uh, Kwame. And uh, yeah, he's going to be with us and talk about uh, what's going on with our, our money. And um, he's, he's actually right across the street from me. That's where uh, his office is here in Chicago. But we're looking forward to uh, hearing from him. And then we're going to roll out next month. I'm, I'm really excited about next month, uh, um, uh, Domestic Violence uh, Awareness Month. And we've got a number of speakers lined up. And um, we're going to, you know, uh, I, I'm just excited about what we're going to talk about next month uh, as well. OK, and then just a look ahead of that. We haven't had this conversation yet, uh, Karen, but uh, we'll be having uh, at least a month, possibly a month and a half of uh, the charities that we support uh, telling us how they've how they're doing, what their current needs are sure. and what the, and what they've done with our money in uh, the uh, past 18 months or so. And so we'll we'll discuss how to fit that in and where and what's best. And I know but you're doing such a great job. I just I'm really grateful. And I know how hard that is. I you know, I yeah, I just know what you have to do to pull this off. And it's a lot of work. Um, is, is Jamaica aboard? Uh, I'd like to remind everyone as we kind of are nearly out of time with a minute and a half to go that uh, this evening is a really important meeting at 6 o'clock p.m. with the district uh, sponsored DEI uh, additional meeting. I think we had a series of three and this might be the fourth one that was added on with our own club member Xavier Ramey and Dr. Uh, Jenkins. And uh, it just sounds like it's going to be a great presentation panel discussion. And uh, we did send out, I think, four times now the link. So I believe you all have the link. If for some reason uh, you've lost track of it and you'd really like to dial in, uh, please contact me through my email or text me or call me. I'll be available to, to help you to log in if anyone uh, still would like to participate and doesn't have the information. Um, Let's see, it seems like there was one other thing. Oh, just in, in this uh, spirit of inclusion, uh, here we're talking about this evening, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know that you, like I, get way too much email. And hopefully you have an opportunity, probably better than me, I hope, to uh, go through and clear junk mail that comes your way and to get off a list and so on. I know that with Rotary, and particularly some of these auto reminders, you get a lot of emails. And you might think, well, it's really important, but I can always get to that later. I'd like to encourage you to open your uh, Rotary email very quickly to get the gist of it. Uh, you may not need to respond to everything, but but to have full inclusion, 
uh, we need to have active participants in the process. And this club for decades has elicited the support, elicited information, sentiment, uh, have, have made decisions at the board level based on input from members. Um, again, as for these committees, every member role that's been assigned is in keeping with the desired interest of the club member. There is no exception. Uh, we may have, um, you know, have had conversations from club members where they uh, dis discussed what it is that they wanted to, what they meant by their application. But nonetheless, let's let's all work together to uh, continue to make the Rotary Club of Maywood Proviso uh, uh, one of the most inclusive clubs within Rotary International. We can always be much better in all areas of operation, including inclusiveness. But I just want to encourage you and your partnership in that regard. Uh, thank Karen again for our speaker today. All of you for your continued commitment to service above self. Have a wonderful day and thank you.